what is our response going to be, especially as young Catholics? Because today's youth is tomorrow's future. And both good people and bad people understand that. So we count on you. The Church, Our Lady, Heaven counts on you. also wonderful to see events like this where there is a sense of community, a sense of being around people who understand you and who are trying to live the same kind of life and build the same kind of world that you are. Welcome to another edition of Church and State with Chris Ferrara and Brian McCall. It's uh, towards the end of April. We're in the Easter season, but uh, yet more shenanigans going on in Church and State. Oh, hi, Brian. Is that you? <laughs> what a surprise. What a surprise. Uh, how have you been the last few weeks? Uh, well, you know, we're in the middle of uh, an unending storm of insanity. So much nonsense and so little time to talk about it. That's right. Well, let's start uh, in the state. We have a lot going on in various courtrooms this past week. <laughs> uh, the Supreme Court, first of all, heard, heard oral arguments in a case of some people convicted for um, walking around the Capitol uh, on January 6th under an, a statute adopted after the Enron financial debacle uh, of the early 2000s uh, and uh, for having, quote, obstructed uh, a proceeding. It was a part of the Enron anti-fraud statute that was meant to go after sleazy businessmen who were destroying evidence of their own financial corruption. Mm -hmm. of uh, but somehow this is being used to convict people who got into the Capitol on January 6th. So I, I listened to some of the oral argument. It sounded like a uh, majority of justices were not buying it, that this was obviously ridiculous. I think, uh, I think it was Alito asked. So there's been a lot of people breaking into over the years when I've been a justice here, protesting, disrupting. How many times has the Justice Department prosecuted them under this statute? None. None. It was, it was just uh, utter crickets. So what do you think of it? If it the indications seem to be they're going to quash these convictions, what are the implications for that, for the for this whole witch hunt and for the one of the Trump trials? Well, let's look a little more closely at the ridiculous theory involved. So under yeah. this uh, statute, which has two sections, subsection one and subsection two, uh, the idea is that if in the course of investigating business shenanigans, you corruptly destroy evidence, you know, in other words, you have to have a corrupt intent and thereby impede the official uh, proceeding, meaning a judicial proceeding to investigate your corrupt business practices. Well, then you're guilty of a felony, which carries a maximum prison sentence of 20 years in the federal penitentiary. So it's an evidentiary destruction prohibition designed to get at the problem that was identified during the so-called Enron scandal. So now they're applying this to political protesters on the theory that they're obstructing an official proceeding. What is an official proceeding? Well, it's any proceeding of a governmental entity of any kind, mm. theoretically. So the oral argument exposed just how ridiculous this theory is, because if that is the interpretation of official proceeding, that all political protests that disrupt any official proceeding whatsoever, not just a judicial proceeding in search of evidence, but any official proceeding would be a federal offense, a felony carrying up to 20 years in federal prison. So obviously the majority is not buying this ridiculous theory. What was amusing about the oral argument was how they were ridiculing the government's position. Mm. So Prey Logar, the uh, Solicitor General, uh, with her robotic, intensely annoying voice, by the way. 
That's true. <laughs> it goes on and on and on saying absolutely nothing about how this statute could possibly apply to, say, a protest that shuts down a courtroom or a congressman pulling a fire alarm and delaying a congressional vote, as a congressman did. I forget his name. Who cares? But again, not even a hypothetical. Some of you actually even hypothetical. <laughs> so then Gorsuch is saying, would that uh, carry a 20-year prison sentence? It's a felony. And uh, Prelogar goes on and on in her robotic voice, saying absolutely nothing, trying to draw a distinction between some disruptions of official proceeding that the government wouldn't prosecute and other disruptions of official proceedings that they would prosecute, namely anything involving Trump. Right. And basically she had no distinction to make that was meaningful. She basically says, well, we would just like to use this against Trump. Can't we please? Huh? <laughs> and, and the, and the majority of the Supreme court is obviously not buying it. Although Trump didn't actually come up by name. Mm. This was actually a case on appeal by a J six protester who disrupted an official proceeding by ambling around the Capitol proceeding, uh, the, the building, Capitol yeah. building, between the velvet ropes like a tourist. <laughs> if you look at the video, they're walking politely between the velvet ropes. They're not even turning over the boundaries that were, were set for the general public when they go on a walking tour of the Capitol. So the, obviously this, this uh, misapplication of Section 1512 is going to be set aside by the Supreme Court. And Jack Smith the ruthless pursuer of Republicans with made-up crimes that no one has ever been charged with before, is already indicating that he's just going to ignore the Supreme Court decision, and he's going to take the position that, well, Trump destroyed evidence under subsection 1 because he was all in favor of the certificates of the alternate electors. How, how is that the destruction of documentary evidence? Right. Yeah, that's an even more ludicrous misfit than the original attempt to misuse mm. statute. So it's just, it's just an example of how in order to get one man, basically the entire judicial system, if you think the abortion distortion was something, that, that's nothing compared to this. The entire judicial system is being distorted at every turn to get Trump into jail. I mean, it is really is a Trump derangement syndrome. It's like oh, it's, yeah. I mean, everything is we have to – to preserve justice, we have to destroy justice. To preserve democracy and elections, we have to rig elections. I mean, the whole thing is just just absurd. But the point I come back to on this is if these people were really bad people and they were doing violent things, there's lots of crimes out there to charge them with, like breaking in, dis public disorder, uh, uh, damage to property. Like, why are none of those charges being brought? Why do you have to find a financial mismanagement cover-up law to try to shoehorn them in? Because they want these people in the Washington, D.C. gulag yeah. for long prison sentences, mm. basically because of a trespass in, in I'd say, 80 90 percent of the cases. It's a nonviolent trespass. And even the violent trespassers who damage property, well, prosecute them for damaging property. Right. And then put them away for an appropriate prison term for someone who went into the Capitol. Maybe he knocked something over or maybe he put his foot up on Nancy Pelosi's desk. My word, the <laughs> royal desk defiled <laughs> by a MAGA protester. Well, for that offense against the royal dignity of Nancy Pelosi, you could certainly justify some sort of prison sentence in, in, in addition to the simple trespass. But not what they're looking for here, which is seven, eight, up to 17 years yep. in the federal penitentiary. Get these plebeians out, really. Yeah, the most, the most egregious sentence, I think, was 17 years for wow. the Proud Boy organizer, supposedly, yeah. who organized things without ever being in Washington, D.C. They put mm -hmm. them away for 17 years for that. <laughs> so what's going to happen is a lot of these convictions are going to be overturned, and the sentences will have to be reduced. Mm. So meanwhile, while the Supreme Court's doing this, the jury selection is underway for, I mean, the more la most laughable of the, the I almost did a spit take. I mean, <laughs> for the <laughs> misdemeanor turned into a felony for a bookkeeping way of accounting for a payment in New York. Well, that, this is, this is uh, 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 Attorney General Barr was no fan of Trump. No. At least not since he ceased to be his Attorney General has called this case an abomination, mm -hmm. an abomination, which is what it is. When you think about it, uh, the 
federal government and the Southern District, which is certainly after Trump, declined to prosecute the so-called election law violation because it didn't involve campaign expenditure. The Federal Elections Commission wouldn't even consider a fine, didn't even didn't even conclude that there was a, a, a violation warranting a fine. The previous uh, prosecutor, uh, the district attorney in Manhattan, declined hmm. to prosecute. Bragg himself declined to prosecute. But then this fellow Pomerantz writes a book bemoaning the fact that no one would prosecute Trump for this terrible offense of sloppy bookkeeping. And because of the public furor generated by Pomerantz's book, Bragg reverses himself and mm. re resurrects what they call the zombie case. And what is this case? Well, the, the theory is this ridiculous. The theory is, well, uh, so Cohen, Trump's lawyer at the time, decides to pay off Stormy Daniels, takes out a home equity loan, pays her the $100,000 or whatever the sum was, and then gets reimbursed through billings for legal services, including the payoff of Stormy Daniels. And whoever the accountant was makes a bookkeeping entry that he was reimbursed for legal expenses, including the payoff of Stormy Daniels. Oh, that's a misleading bookkeeping entry, which Trump didn't make, by the way. Probably mm -hmm. had no knowledge of the bookkeeping entry. The whole idea said Cohen in one of his many statements that he's attempting to repudiate now he didn't want trump to know that he did it he just wanted trump to reimburse him for the payments he made so the, the idea is well this is a false bookkeeping entry well that's a misdemeanor hmm. and the statute of limitations ran on that long ago so how does he resurrect these misdemeanors because there are 34 bookkeeping entries this is the usual practice of overcharging. Every check that was wrote is treated as a separate offense. 34 bookkeeping entries, i.e. 34 misdemeanors, on which the statute of limitations had expired. So how does he revive it? Well, he says you were trying to conceal a, another crime, which was your violation of federal election law, a non-existent violation of federal election law. And so that means that the statute of limitations still operates as to that felony that you're trying to conceal. And so we can charge you with felonious bookkeeping entries because the felonious bookkeeping entries were designed to conceal the felonious violation of federal election law, which is non-existent. That the, election, that the Federal Election Commission wouldn't do anything about. Yeah, that's how ridiculous this case is. Yes. It's a non-crime. Yeah, it's a prosecution in search of a crime. Yeah, in fact, <laughs> the, the indictment is not even a speaking indictment. It doesn't actually say that the bookkeeping entries were designed to conceal federal election law violations, which are felonies. It just says he was trying to conceal some sort of felony mm. without specifying what the felony is. So I guess when the trial unfolds, then we'll find out for the first time what the felony is, mm. or maybe it's in the bill of particulars that defense counsel has gotten. So th this is uh, an obvious concoction. Mm. It's absolutely ludicrous. But what's even more ludicrous is they're trying to find in New York City people that are not biased against Trump to sit on the jury. <laughs> that's yeah. that's yeah. like trying to find a, a needle in a haystack. Yeah, um, yeah. It may, and it, but you know what? I, I, there's a couple of lawyers that they've seated already. They're probably Democrats. I would say it's a certainty that they're Democrats. Yeah. And then there's an Irish immigrant mm. that they seated on the jury who was the foreman of the jury. Yes. So all it's going to take is one juror to have enough honesty to say, come on, this is ridiculous. Yeah. And just refuse to convict. Mm. So I'm optimistic to that extent. He's not going to get acquitted. Mm. Uh, but well, he'll, there's enough common sense in one or two jurors who know, as everyone knows, this is just a concocted charge to try to get Trump behind bars before the election. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting, you you get, because what they've been doing is asking questions of jurors, talking to them to try to make cases for them not being on the jury. And the prosecution has been hilarious because one of the things they've been asking them, they said, well, essentially, paraphrasing, our star witness is this guy, Cohen, who's been convicted of lying before. Uh, would you have a problem like <laughs> believing him? And if you would have a problem believing him, then you can't be a fair juror. Like, Unbelievable! I mean, that was the most absurd line of questioning. And so then, like, I, I, I didn't know that they're yeah. being allowed to ask a juror, yeah, to 
to find someone credible who's already been convicted of lying. Exactly. Would you be able to have an open mind as to the testimony of a convicted felon who's a liar? I mean, it's that absurd. Any, well, anybody who says yes to that is obviously going to convict Trump. Yeah. Oh, of course. Of course. And, it, and of course, the, the people who wouldn't convict Trump being uh, Republicans, the few that there are in the right. jury pool, will be too honest. Right. This happens in the abortion cases, too. The pro boards say, oh, I can keep an open mind about this charge against this pro-life activist. And that, so he gets he or she gets seated on the jury if it's a jury trial, whereas the pro-lifer will say, well, I'll try to be honest, but I have to tell you, I mean, I really have pro-life <laughs> Right. right. So the Democrats lie and the Republicans tell the truth. So the Democrats will get onto the jury yep. and there'll be one or two at least, at the very least, stealth jurors who lie through their teeth about being impartial so they can be one of the jurors to put Trump in jail. Well, and they already – I mean Trump's lawyers already, already caught a few of them because yeah. they started asking them. and like, oh, no, I have no bias at all. And they go, what about all these social media posts? And they just read out this stuff they say against Trump. How does that mean you're not biased against the guy? Oh, oops. <laughs> I mean, it's, okay, I lied. Yeah, yeah, okay, you got me. But so, since, we're, just, since we're accepting the testimony of liars in this courtroom, why can't I be on the jury? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, the sad thing that was – really, this may not even be about getting him behind bars. What it's really about is tying the guy up in courtroom for two months. I mean this trial is expected to go on for two months. Every day he's sitting there wasting his time listening to this drivel. He's not out able to campaign for president. And maybe that really has been the objection all along. The well, that's, that's, all that's a primary objective. So if he gets convicted – Maybe uh, a bonus, right? So, so maybe if he gets convicted the way they've structured this – if you convict them on one of the bookkeeping entries on this ridiculous theory, they're all the same entries pertaining to the same transaction. Yeah. So there could be theoretically 34 felony convictions. Yeah. <laughs> so what would Judge Mersham do? Uh, would he remand Trump immediately to jail pending appeal? Or would he, because that just stinks to high heaven, not even this hack would do that. Would he allow him to remain free pending appeal? Well, if he allows him to remain free pending appeal, I think it's going to propel him into the White House. Yeah. So people are going to say, oh, yeah, really? You think you can put my favorite candidate in jail? I'm going to vote for him and we'll put him into office and let's see what you do then. Yeah, exactly. So we'll, we'll see. You uh, really have to get him into a jail cell because yeah. I don't think you really think about it. I don't think that he, the fact that he's tied up in a courtroom – five days a week is really going to negatively affect his ability to campaign. He'll just campaign on the weekends and sometimes at night, like on Friday night, on Saturday and Sunday. Well, and, and frankly, this trial will give him rocket fuels. For that's what life. I was going to say. Essentially he's campaigning in the courtroom <laughs> just by being there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would run ads of all the shots, the still shots from him in the courtroom where they have him tied up on this nonsense. Yes. And, oh, yeah, but you know what? There's a peril for him here if he testifies. A lawyer friend of mine pointed out that if he testifies and gets convicted, well, we'll go after him for perjury. Mm. The jury didn't believe you. It's also a sentence enhancement under New York law. Well, you testified and you tied up the courtroom with your lying testimony. So that makes for an enhanced sentence of incarceration. If Mershom has the, you know, the temerity to impose a jail sentence on a former president of the United States based on bookkeeping. Mm, exactly. Well, speaking of nonsense, let's pass over to Rome. And a uh, nice Easter gift that came out of the Vatican was another bizarre document. Um, the, there's apparently been in the work for years over at the Congregation for, for the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, but it, it took two show Fernandez to finally get it done and, and get it out. That brilliant Thomistic philosopher, oh wait, sorry, no, uh, the Kissing <laughs> Cardinal. Uh, it's called The Infinite Dignity of Man. Uh, so I just want to stop, it's supposed to be about human dignity. Uh, because they basically say, since you know, fifty or sixty years ago, i.e., Second Vatican Council, there's been a lot of confusion about what's meant for by human dignity, uh, and so we're going to set the record straight and explain what it means. And in classic modernist fashion, this long document that's meant to clarify a term does nothing but 
confuse it further, <laughs> right? It's very classic. Now, I mean, I just want to start with the title and just show you this is this this document's got some practical points we may talk about that are bad, but it's basically fundamentally a philosophical document that is philosophical 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 ignorance and gobbledygook. I mean, first of all, I just want to point out they talk about the infinite dignity of man. Well, from the philosophical spec perspective, man is a finite creature. Everything about man is finite. There is nothing infinite about man. That's why our Lord Jesus Christ had to come and die for us, because we had no way of compensating for an infinite offense against God. Only God could do that. So this whole idea that we're somehow equal to God, we have an, e an infinite dignity, is there at the very title of this document, the heart of its, um, its problem? Well, uh, a finite creature can't have infinite dignity. Really? You're such a stickler, Lion. <laughs> what, what are you trying? Are you trying to be logical? I know. I'm a party pooper. What can I say? You know, again, what's the real point of this document? It's the, ch the church, please, 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 we can be good revolutionaries too. Can't you let us come to the UN party? That's essentially what this is about. The UN's Declaration of Human Rights is celebrating its 75th anniversary. And like Paul VI, we too can have the cult of man. That's what this document is all about. Well, also, they, they do recognize a distinction between what they call ontological dignity and moral uh, dignity and moral dignity although i'm not sure that distinction has any roots in constant teaching of the church yeah. on what happens when you sin mortally when you sin mortally you lose your dignity in god's sight you have yes. to restore it through the sacrament of confession yes and then you're restored to the supernatural life of the life of grace. You're regenerated in grace. But sin causes a loss of dignity. So they try to separate that out from what they call ontological dignity. Mm. So they have three categories here. Ontological dignity, moral dignity, social dignity, and existential dignity. Wow. So that's one, two, three, four kinds of dignity in one person. And so, they don't even explain the difference between ontological and existential dignity. It gets all blurred together. So you're right. It almost looks like three because they say four, but then they don't really understand the fourth one. <laughs> ontological dignity is indelible. Well, yeah. of course, everything that exists has a certain dignity. Yes. Which is indelible. indelible. And in the case of humans, that's a permanent dignity because we are sent eternal creatures. We have an eternal destiny. In the case of animals, whatever dignity they have as created beings ceases when their existence ceases on death. So, sure, there is a permanent element of dignity in the human creature, but it's not infinite. Yeah, exactly. And the dignity that comes with the state of the soul, that dignity is lost. The soul becomes devoid of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost on uh, on the occasion of a mortal sin. Mm. Now, I haven't studied the document all that carefully because I really don't care, frankly. <laughs> you didn't miss much. <laughs> well, but I'm wondering, do they make do they make a distinction? Do they talk of the uh, a serious loss of dignity? No, no. It's all about how great we are, and you got to respect everybody's dignity, essentially. But on the philosophical side, I want to read one sentence because it's just amazing that this isn't a document of the Catholic Church. Okay, well, I have it in front of me. Let's follow together. Even in the writings of such modern thinkers as Descartes and Kant, who, who challenged some foundations of traditional Catholic anthropology, one can still strongly perceive echoes of revelation. So these great villains of modern philosophy who destroyed it, Descartes and Kant, I mean, they're really still good guys, though. I mean, they really were actually had echoes of revelation. So all your lectures you've given over the years in Garda about how horrible these people were, Chris, you were just really overdoing it. <laughs> What's the big problem with Descartes? All he really did was separate the soul from the body and destroy the whole concept of man as a <laughs> unity of matter and form. Now, in a way, uh, they're celebrating someone who actually detracted yeah. from the dignity of the soul. Yes. By, by attempting to separate it from the human body and reduce the human being to basically – a collection of atoms attached in some way to a soul. Yes. 
So uh, it, it's a mess, of course. But the idea that people who are suffering from what the catechism still calls, unless Francis gets around changing that too, an intrinsic disorder, which inclines them to acts of grave depravity, are entitled to our respect as such. It's just another affirmation of this idea that people suffering from what is obviously a severe impairment of their dignity must nonetheless be respected in that state. Yes, exactly. Well, and the other problem with this is classic Francis type document. Uh, me, myself, and I are the main sources. So I just want to start at footnote nine and just read off to you the sources that are cited. Nine, Francis. 10, Francis. 11, <laughs> Ibid. 12, Ibid. 13, Ibid. <laughs> 14. Oh, don't forget, though, we have the UN Declaration. Should, exactly, we have the Not, UN Declaration. Oh, oh wow, you've, you've looked a major source here, the International Theological Commission. Uh, of course. Followed um, by Francis. Followed by Francis, of course. Again, it's Vatican II, Francis, with a few one or two nods to say it's not all Francis to everything else. Um, and then see. we oh, get. You know what? I can do something right now and tell you just how many times Francis is cited in this document. <laughs> 76 times. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> 76 times. What what Pope has ever cited himself 76, 76 times? 76 times in one document. He's a doctor of the church, clearly. It's, and he's, he, this is the Pope who's constantly condemning self-referential Catholics. Yes. Talk about being, he's the most self-referential Pope in the history of the papacy. Oh, exactly. He might have referred to himself more times in one encyclical than the last 76, 76 popes. popes, right. <laughs> Well, but then we also get a sense of, because then he says the whole document is about dignity, 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 all, all these bad people that do things that are against dignity, and we get a sense of his priorities. So the number one thing in his list against human dignity, not abortion, the drama of poverty. Oh. Number one, the drama of poverty. Number two, war. Again, for him, I wouldn't be surprised he comes out with there's no no just war theory. War is always unjust since he's jettisoned the, the death penalty, which he references and says the death penalty by definition is always prohibited because it always offends against human dignity. Yeah, I'm looking at that now. He has a, a list, as you say, uh, subhuman living conditions, arbitrary yeah. imprisonment, de deportation. Deportation? Really? You can't yeah. deport anybody? <laughs> Slavery, prostitution, the selling of women and children, degrading working conditions, and, of course, the death penalty. Is there a reference to abortion anywhere here? Uh, there is a, a little bit later on, eventually, kind of an, oh, by the way. Murder, genocide, abortion, euthanasia, and willful yeah. suicide. Okay, fine. So he does mention abortion. He does now, the, mention death, the death penalty is not only not contrary to human dignity, but as the constant teaching of the church, beginning with the revelation of the Old Testament teaches, is actually an affirmation and defense of human dignity. The Catechism of the Council of yes. Trent says the fifth commandment is vindicated by the death penalty. Pius XII teaches that someone who deliberately murders an innocent has forfeited his own right to life and therefore is justly punished by the death penalty, which also has a wonderful expiatory purpose. Because if you know your death is coming on a date certain because you're going to be executed, that will bring about, in many cases, and, and we, history shows this, a religious conversion. That person, quote, steals heaven, mm. like the thief on the cross. But, of course, Francis would deny that. He would force uh, the state to imprison someone for life so that person can wallow in a sinkhole of immorality, including contra not contraception, pornography, which is mm. rampant in prisons. Mm. That it seems to me, life imprisonment in these hell holes is far more contrary to human dignity than the execution that brings about repentance. Uh, absolutely. So, and again, he's just out of thin air, thrown away two thousand years of Catholic dogma on the death penalty. So let it be written. So let it be done. Francis has spoken. Right. In this case, seventy-six times. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, last one I'll pick. There's a category called gender theory, and I thought, mm -hmm. okay, good. First sentence, the church wishes, first of all, to reaffirm that every person, regardless of sexual orientation, ought to be respected in his or her dignity. Well, what happened to this distinction between moral 
ontological. Now they're just well, whatever dignity. Forget all that stuff we said at the beginning. And treated with consideration. Well, first of all, the very phrase sexual orientation is a poison pill. Yes. Because when a Vatican document issued with the authority of the Pope says that there's such a thing as sexual orientation other than male and female, it's already given away all the ground necessary for the enemy to triumph on this issue. You can say whatever you want after that. But once you say a person has an orientation as opposed to an intrinsic disorder, mm. then you're saying that person is, this person is perfectly fine given that or orientation and has no obligation to cease being afflicted by that so-called orientation. So uh, the inclination is left as is. Mm. And what's the next step? Well, then the acts performed because of that disordered inclination can no longer be condemned as mortally sinful. Mm. And that's the whole theme of this pontificate. Uh, exactly. And this is sort of underscoring philosophically fiducia supplicans or sodomy supplicans, I mean, essentially. I'm afraid that's what it is. I mean, he may not say that explicitly, yeah. but his words are, un are undermined at every turn by his deeds. Think of all yes. the people he's welcomed to the Vatican for special audiences. And his statements to the effect that you're born that way. Well, if you're born that way, you can't help yourself. There's no moral accountability mm -hmm. for a condition that you were born with. That's the way God made you. God made you that way is what he said specifically. Mm -hmm. One of his many statements, I don't have the exact source here, but he said to someone of a so-called sexual orientation that is not male or female in the normal sense, God made you that way. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it. It's over. You've That's considered it. that all these disorientations are divinely willed. So where is the basis for any kind of condemnation of those disordered inclinations and the acts performed because of them? Uh, it's game over. You're absolutely right. That's the whole idea. Well, there you have it. You don't need to read this pages and pages of drivel uh it's not worth your time that's the, that's the takeaway i think from it just go back to your catechism and you'll get a clear answer yeah and if you don't believe me it was may 21st 2018 it was reported without a denial by francis that he told the chilean survivor of clerical uh, sexual abuse who was a homosexual Juan Carlos, that's not a problem. You have to be happy with who you are. God made you this way and loves you this way, and the Pope loves you this way. That's it. Game over. Yeah, absolutely. So. Well, there you have uh, trials of the faith in, Va in a Vatican document and trials of uh, the Taurus and Trump in uh, the United States. Uh, but we get, remember, we don't need to be worried about these things. Our Lady's Immaculate Heart will triumph. We have to do our part. So again, want to remind you about the 100 by 100 challenge of the Fatima Center to have 100,000 first Saturday communions of reparation by the 100th anniversary of her, Our Lady's request. So go to the FatimaCenter.org, Fatima.org website uh, and find the 100 by 100. You can sign up and uh, contribute to this great spiritual bouquet, which will hasten the passing away of these, this nonsense, which we know uh, will have to happen in Our Lady's Triumph. I'm in the middle of one right now, and attached to that is the promise of final perseverance. Yes. It's, that's, that, that's a deal you cannot refuse. <laughs> exactly. Our Lady has made an offer we can't refuse, so why not take it up? Until the next time, then. All right. Till next time. Looking forward to, to uh, seeing what's developed in these stories, and uh, have a good couple weeks. See you then. <laughs>